thank you so much for your time, you know, like um, within the chat with me. So I'm just like curious about, you know, how you started at Unity. So I know Unity from my friend, uh, as you know, like his brother worked at Unity before. So and then I was just like discovered this small brand in LA. So I'm just curious, you know, how your background is and then how you decided to say, hey, I want to start this coffee business. Sure. Um, I own Unity with uh, two other people, one of which is a full-time business partner and one who is at this point just um, in the background. Um, we started the company in 2017 and that came after us were all working together for uh, three to four years in coffee. Um, my one business partner has been in coffee significantly longer than me. Um, and we worked for a different company uh, in New York that was called Pushcart. Um, got my Pushcart coffee mug right here. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point in, I think about 2016, we were a couple years into um, being the operators of the, the roastery at Pushcart. Uh, the owner wanted to go, we basically wanted to go in different directions. Um, he was less interested in roasting coffee and more interested in his cafes. And we were the opposite. Um, so we found that as a good outlet to take the company uh, our, our own direction um, and buy out any assets that he had um, invested in the company. And at that point, um, Adam, my business partner was in the process of moving to Los Angeles and it was all very uncertain as to what was happening. Um, but he began making sales out, out this way in LA. Uh, I was in New York and we were shipping coffee every week. Um, you know, we'd fulfill all our New York accounts and ship out to the West coast. And at some point between I'd say 2018 and 2019, um, Los Angeles really just became a, a huge market for us. Um, credit to Adam for putting in the legwork to make that happen. And so all of a sudden um, things kind of flipped and he was roasting on the West Coast and I was just doing a, a little bit of the, the business on the East Coast. And um, I ended up moving out to Los Angeles at the end of 2021 and we consolidated mm -hmm. operations out here. Um, in terms of starting the business, um, like I'll, I'll speak personally now, um, I, I don't know if I, I never envisioned, um, well, I never envisioned working in coffee, uh, and then I, I, I can't say certainly, um, I envisioned owning a company in coffee, um, but I think my skill sets do uh, allow for it to be a good fit for me. Um, is this good? Do you want more information on? Yeah. Um, Sorry, uh, give me a second. My cat is driving me crazy right now. All good. Don't come in. Sorry, she wants to hang out. Okay, you can keep going. <laughs> um, do you want me to speak more about my start in coffee or the start of the company or? Yeah, just like what are your personal story? I just want to know that your motivation and then you know how that journey took you. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give a very brief history of me and coffee. Um, I moved to New York in 2013. Um, I had never worked a day in the beverage industry in my life, but I, I did have an un underlying interest in in beverages. Um, I was watching a lot of podcasts about wine. Um, and that, that was as like a 17 year old who didn't drink. I was just very curious about it. Um, mm -hmm. same went for tea. I was very much in, interested in, um, just w once I figured out like, oh, black tea, you brew it differently than a, a white tea or, or an oolong. It really, uh, opened something up for me, I think. And so anyway, I moved to New York and luckily I found this, this company, Pushcart Coffee, uh, who, at, at its peak had five or six cafes all through Manhattan and Brooklyn. And um, they were hiring and, and willing to train from the ground up. Uh, that's a rare opportunity in New York, or at least it was in 2013. Um, 
many specialty coffee companies in New York, you need to go in as a barista with at least like a year of experience or some other quality that made you a good fit there. Um, none of which I necessarily had. Um, and so, yeah, um, they were hiring for a new cafe and I began working there and under a year, I think into me working there, they, they began roasting their own coffee. And so that's just, uh, I became the like apprentice roaster, uh, got trained up on how to roast coffee, um, what that looks like. Uh, cause at that point I, I had no, truly no idea of what I was getting into. Um, so were you a coffee, heavy coffee, coffee drinker before that? Not, not really. Uh, I wasn't a coffee drinker until I was an adult. Um, like, I think I probably, I didn't drink till I was 21. And I think I probably drank before I actually was interested in coffee. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just knew with my background in tea, um, which was not, that extensive, um, that there was probably more to coffee than met the eye. Uh, cause at that point, all I knew was the very basics, like, Oh, I can make a, I can buy this bag of pre-ground Starbucks and then take it home and put it in a French press and it'll taste different than putting it through a coffee brewer, a, a Mr. Coffee or something. And, uh, so I, I started with, with very humble roots in coffee, I would say. Um, so, yeah, um, once we kicked off in 2017, uh, Unity, I was obviously in a much different place in my coffee journey at that point. Um, just, I, I was lucky enough to have been, um, been able to travel to Coffee Origin a couple times at that point. Um, and that was impactful. Uh, you know, anytime you can see where something comes from, I think it gives a better understanding of what you're dealing with um mm -hmm. and which countries do you go oh uh, th have i been to so far or uh, the, yeah which countries do you go when you say you went to uh, travel to coffee origin several times um i've been to mostly colombia and guatemala um <laughs> i've also been to ethiopia and mexico um We've not got to travel in the last couple of years, obviously, but uh, it's something we're hoping to do more of as soon. I mean, it, it's now reasonably safe to do so. Um, we're just uh, at, a, at a point where it's about making sure every, everyone at Origin will be safe um, and just doing things responsibly. Uh, we've managed, you can easily run a coffee company with no traveling to origin it's it's very easy to only talk to your importers and for them to send you samples and you say this tastes great i'm gonna buy it um and then really have no connection to that coffee it's difficult uh to forge relationships with farmers and keep in touch with them year-round not just be concerned about the final product but be concerned about them as your partners in this whole business um, and learning about how you can best support them. And when I say hard, I mean, it just, it takes work to do so. I obviously I can do so from my, my cell phone. Um, and it, while they're out in, in the field, truly working harder than like 99% of professions, um, they, I want to be very clear on that they have the hardest job in this whole industry um but it's you know it um it, it's it's an emotional work to uh stay involved with these families and um it's very meaningful also um i feel very lucky to have the connections that we do um primarily in guatemala and colombia um, but, you know, we're, we're working on more of that in places like Mexico. Um, and in some ways, it's like waiting for the su supply chain to catch up to us. Um, we are 
striving for and, and really wanting to forge connections with farmers in a lot of places. But um, the in the um, economic systems there are not set up for us to do so uh, always. So like it, it's it's until a couple of years ago, it was impossible. It, it was not possible to like uh, us as a company buy from a single farmer in Ethiopia um, because of the way that their markets are set up there. Um, and now it is possible for us to buy from individuals in Ethiopia, though they have to be on the, the larger side of the um, coffee growing spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a bit challenging to buy from a single individual farmer with them just, just growing the coffee in their backyard. And um, at that point, it's mostly about like, well, the, the economic logistics are tough and then but the, the the logistics logistics are tough. You know, they 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 get like a few big sacks of coffee, and now you have to um, trace that all the way to a roastery somehow, so we can say like, oh yeah, this is from this one farmer. Uh, I feel like I'm getting off on a tangent though. <laughs> no, I'm really uh, enjoying listening. Um, I went to Tanzania before. I was doing volunteer there, and I went to their coffee farm, and now see how they did a process before I'm not like a you no know, like coffee lover I drink coffee but I'm not like obsessed with it and uh -huh. it was just really interesting for me to see the process and know how like uh how they do like the traditional coffee process and I can imagine you know you like trying to buy coffee bean straight to the from source straight from like those families like for me it was like do you still travel to those countries to try to maintain a relationship like how do you do that um, well, like I said, the last few years, um, it's not been possible, but yes, um, we, it, it's, it's the best part of the job. I won't lie about that. Like, it, it's amazing. Um, if nothing else from like the adventure standpoint to go visit these farms, um, and see really beautiful land, um, some, it, you can see some pretty remote places that, um you just don't have that kind of access to typically mm -hmm. um, and so is, is the question like do we plan to continue to do so uh no i was curious I, so how do you maintain that uh if you're not traveling there do you have someone there like like a middleman to help you to manage that yeah that, like connecting that's, with those families it's a very good question um in most cases when a coffee roaster is going to go visit a country of origin it's going to be through well you you basically have two different groups who work together um in this case which would be your exporter and your importer most of the interfacing that we do is with our importer and our, our importers we, who we work with a handful of them uh they have their people working in the country and they're going to be the ones mostly who facilitate the visit who say hey unity is coming down and we're going to come by your farm on this day and we're going to be in the city on this day and visiting these two other farms the next day um that's how it mostly works we have a couple of families um specifically i'll, I'll just use their name uh the via toro family in um Way, way to Nango, Guatemala. We work with them pretty directly at this point. Um, we they we were initially introduced to them, to them through an importer, but um, we've got to visit a few times now, uh, and they have a, a very beautiful area that they own in um, the northwest of Guatemala, and. Um, most of our interactions with them is just us texting them, emailing them, FaceTiming, um, whatever works, and then uh, getting to visit them. And we'd love more of that kind of relationship. Uh, it is pretty difficult. Um, we're not, it takes a lot of legal, logistical work to get coffee from where it was grown into the United States. Uh, and that's not our specialty. That's not our know-how. So we typically have to work with importers to do that kind of work. Um,
but in this case, it's less, it, it's, it's more us interfacing with the farmer and being like, hey, importer, we need this coffee. Can you bring it in? And then they do it uh, versus the importer controlling most aspects of the communication. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, well, imagine like because like you are trying to you know buy serve on a source and have like connection with the family, and that actually, I mean, this seems like a model that will cost more than just like buying coffee beans from someone. Uh, wait, does it? It just seems more? like like it seems like that will be you know like a lot of extra cost than just buying coffee beans with uh buying you know the coffee beans from like one importer um how did you manage that like how do you manage like the like i don't know if there's like some sort of price in flush in uh flush fluctuation and how do you you know like make sure like quality and the price is like what you want well by working more directly with the farmer the goal there is to maximize the profit going to the farmer mm -hmm. uh, we're going to buy coffee from them um, obviously as a business owner, like it'd be great if it was just as cheap as possible. And, um, then I could roast it and sell it and make a big profit. That isn't what we are doing here. Um, like by, by cutting out the importer, um, or not, we're not cutting out the importer, but we're less dependent on a single importer for this coffee, let's say, um, it allows more of the the, if the overall profits for the coffee equal one, then a greater amount of that one can go to the farmer in this case. Um, meanwhile, we might be paying a little bit less money um, to the importer um, and thusly the coffee is maybe a little bit cheaper for us, but not typically to a degree that is too noticeable. Um, as you mentioned, there is a lot of fluctuation, fluctuations in this marketplace and um, the price of coffee has gone up drastically in the last two years, um, where like coffee that I used to be able to sell for $11 a pound is in some cases going to be like $13.50 a pound this year, just uh, by our, our typical margins and having to charge enough money to stay in business. So um yeah i think the takeaway here is we know that their quality they like everyone has a bad harvest here and there uh and that could that's usually going to be um environmentally driven the the farmers know what to do when they're not getting a lot of rain or if it's unbearing unbearably sunny um or if their trees are in poor health, they know what to do, like to the best of their ability. So typically if the, if, um, the quality isn't there, it's more of an environmental issue. Um, so we're confident that um, if we work with the same people year after year, um, any interruptions in quality are temporary. Um, and it's not indicative of the farmer's ability to do their job. Mm -hmm. um, so we learned that very quickly by visiting. This, this is one of the importances of, of visiting the farmers is you can see how hard they work uh, and just how much, like at this point, um, the fourth generation at least, if not more, but the fourth generation to my knowledge of this family is working in coffee now. and that is so much like they've forgotten more about coffee than i could purport to know at least on the the horticulture and botanical ends of things um so yeah the quality is going to be there year year after year um and it's about paying them a fair price um because again the coffee farmer is does the most work for the least amount of money in in this ecosystem um and 
by knowing this family and, and believing in them and seeing what they've been able to do uh, year after year, um, and I'm just talking about one family in this case, but I, I, I'd like to, we, the goal is obviously to like take this mentality to all of our producing partners eventually. Um, we're, you just tend to be hindered by the supply chain as it exists now, which is hard to overcome. Um, yeah, we, we know the, the fair price of coffee and we wanna maximize the amount going to the farmer and uh, work with those who we believe do the best job. Um, and that is how we will see success, I think, long-term. Mm -hmm. um, so you were mentioning like in the past two years, the price of the coffee has gone up. What's the reason for that? Uh, there's a lot. Um, so first and foremost, the commodity price of coffee is set by Wall Street. Uh, it's called the, the C market, the coffee market. <laughs> and um, that, that's not for like, that isn't necessarily what we're buying. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that Wall Street controls what we pay for coffee. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, they contribute to it because they're, they're basing this price on, um, on futures. Like they, they can say, oh, Brazil had a freeze this year and um, forty percent of their crop is not viable, and so the price of coffee is going up um, because we're going to have a, a big shortage. Or, wow, look at Ethiopia—they had a record harvest, and we have so much coffee now. Um, the price of coffee is going down because of the overwhelming supply we have. It's that times a hundred. Um, very hard to predict, but people who have very little connection to the the individuals in the supply chain themselves um, are responsible for setting the price. So that's one aspect of it. And the, the C market price has gone drastically up recently, which is in theory good for the farmers because that means they can sell their coffee at a higher price. Um, though there are some negatives to it, both of which I'm aware and probably unaware of. Um, it's never a bad thing when the farmer, producer, whoever gets more money, but it, I guess it could be a bad thing where um, the coffee costs more money and that abundance of money is going to the wrong people. I don't, I can't speak to if that's like necessarily happening, but it, it, when we talk about coffee, um, there's a, something I learned, which was called the, the 100 hands of coffee, meaning that between that coffee seed being planted in a nursery and taken care of, developed, grown, picked, sold, uh, exported, imported, eventually getting to me and I roast it and I serve it to somebody, at least 50 people had a, a hand in, in making that happen. That's a lot of different people uh, to make one cup of coffee, obviously. So it, it's more spread out across the supply chain. But when we talk about the 100 hands of coffee, we're talking about generally 50 people contributed to making this happen. Oh, that's insane. I, is that common in food industry? Like having so many like middlemen like in the process? Um, it definitely depends on where you're coming from and, and where the product is, um, what, what the product's origin is. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's like apples, I guess not. Like, you know, I, I know we import apples, um, but we also grow them here domestically. So you grow those in Ohio uh, and they go on a truck and they go in a freezer and go, go to a grocery store or whatever and somebody buys them. Maybe that's a smaller supply chain. I'm probably yeah. oversimplifying the Apple supply chain here. Um, but I'm just saying coffee takes, it, it's a very labor intensive product. Um, I mean, I, I could go through the whole the whole supply chain, but I don't think that's pertinent to what we're talking about here. Yeah. Perhaps. But I mean, you're starting with a seedling that eventually grows into a tree 
and produces cherries. And those cherries have to be, you have to take the seeds out of those cherries, dry them, uh, pack them up, put them into storage. And that's only about half of the, the labor. And there's a whole other half of the supply chain. Right. We're not even talking about there. Um, yeah, that's crazy. So like my dad is like obsessed with tea. I'm originally from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So you know, like there's a lot of different type of tea in Taiwan. And my dad is like absolutely like a tea snob. Okay. <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, he would always buy tea from like different farmers, like mm -hmm. different stores. He doesn't really, he didn't just buy like a generic brand. He would like literally one time he took the whole family to a tea farm to observe how they did like, the whole process. So that's like how much my dad was obsessed with tea. So, um, so as it's interesting, you tell me like the whole process of another coffee, like uh, you know, from the seed to the tree, and then know how like labor intensive it is. But I think that in tea, tea in Taiwan, it's like generally has less hands involved because you know like it's the same country, so they usually just can mm -hmm. sell it to the customer themselves um, instead of having that many middlemen. So the other question is like. I don't know, I'm assuming Unity is expanding, it's growing. Are you planning to like, you know, having more, reach out to more families? And then, you know, how do you find out more farms that you want to work with? Or are you, are you trying to have that more, expand in one family and having them to produce more? Very good question. Um, the goal of our company, we, um, throughout the history of unity we're we're just over five years old but um even before that when we were with pushcart we were working with some of the same families we are now so we've been working with the same people in many cases for eight plus years at this point um you're always realistically going to have to buy from farms that you don't have a connection to at the moment the goal would be to, well, we bought their coffee. Let's go try and build that connection and see if there's something here to um, have long-term and mm -hmm. be able to say, like a, a dream would be, we, we've been buying from a few individuals in Ethiopia to be able to go visit them again um, or for the first time, honestly, and work with those individuals and families year after year, not typically, a possibility right now with the current supply chain. Um, but that being said, our goal as a company has been to limit the amount of people we work with and buy more coffee from the existing connections we have. Um, so previously, or even now, maybe some coffee companies would look at their menu um, and be like, wow, look, we have 28 different coffees that we bought this year. Uh, and we have, look at all that variety we have, and isn't that so good? And it, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying if I buy 10 bags from a farmer I don't have any connection to somewhere because I have to, um, that could be a, a great coffee and I'd be honored to serve it. But it does feel just like I'm missing something with that um, there's like an empty piece in the in that supply chain for me, um, because part of the joy that we have in sharing coffee is sharing the stories of those who grew it, uh, and being able to say, to the best of my ability, I I worked to uh, improve things for them. Um, I mean, they they did all this work in giving me this amazing product, um, I wanted to be able to give something back to them. And so if, if from the, this Viatoro family in Guatemala, if we can double the amount that we buy from them, instead of buying coffee from all over Guatemala with um, a lot less connection, that is, that's where the meaning is for me, I, I would say. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm likely parroting what my business partner would say as well. Um, it's, it's about the connections and the people, which is kind of where the, we got the name unity. Um, we wanted to 
bring that supply chain together um, to a greater extent. Um, yeah, if, if there's no meaning behind buying this coffee, then um, I guess at that point, you're just doing it for a paycheck, which I'll tell you, like, if, if you want to make a lot of money, I wouldn't say go work in coffee. <laughs> it's, there's not all the money to go around in this industry. It's pretty competitive. And um, you're going to make more money doing something on in finance or banking or really in a lot of things. So uh, at this so, point, if money is not your motivation, how is the motivation? I mean, we're a young company, all things considered. Uh, the goal definitely is to build a company that makes money um, and then have more ability to uh, improve the lives of our, our partners at Origin or give to charity and stuff. But I mean, the goal of any company at its core is to you know, stay in business and, and grow. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's, it's not a goal. I'm just saying that as things exist, um, there aren't a ton of people who make a ton of money in, in coffee. Um, there certainly are, uh, but I'm just saying that it's, ha that hasn't been my experience. Um, my, my work every day is beyond keeping the company in business, um, to better the supply chain and give our producing partners, uh, more of the slice of the pie. That's really awesome. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in the past five years, since you started, what would you think the biggest challenge is for you? Of owning a business? Yeah, I just like Unity Coffee, particularly. Um, let me, sorry, one second. I'm gonna quit this thing making this noise. Okay. Um, the biggest challenge? I mean, it's not an easy time to run a business, obviously. Um, and it was, I think when we started in 2017 uh, to 2020, there was a lot of um, just trying to get this thing off the ground. And it seemed like a lot of the times we, we'd land that next big account right in conjunction with like one of our other big accounts going out of business or something like that. Uh, so it's been a struggle to grow as a company. And that was leading into the pandemic and supply chain uh, kerfuffle. So I wouldn't say we're unique in that, um, but you we're roasting more coffee week to week and than we ever have before, but that doesn't necessarily come with um, unending growth as a company because there's always, it's called growing pains for a reason. You, there's always more things to put money towards. We have the biggest um, amount of employees that we've ever had right now. Um, I've got a great team. I feel very lucky about that. Um, but you've got to balance how much can I charge my customers for this product because I don't, I can't just raise prices on them continuously uh, because we have a level of trust here where, um, I, I try and keep my prices as low as possible, but sometimes it's just not possible. So, uh, growth is one of the biggest challenges, uh, because of these external factors to a degree. Um, but it's also like, it's, it's very rewarding in that every week there's something uh, new to, to try and achieve. And 
it's certainly not boring. It, it's definitely stressful, but never boring. So. <laughs> Uh, that's for sure as a business owner there's always surprise <laughs> challenge new task right um the next question i have is probably that my more like my relative to me personally like i'm just scared sometimes it's like huh why if i don't have any order next week huh would i will this business still exist like next month or next year yeah, it, it, you can get really into the minutia of it. And we have a very tangible business model, which is like, we got this amount of pounds ordered this week. We, we roast one day a week right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, oh, look, we were roasting 214 pounds less this week. Uh, why is that? And usually it's because every account is on a different ordering schedule. Uh, ideally, every account would be ordering the same amount every week and it would be perfect, but some weeks they're going to overorder and some weeks they will underorder. And it's all about finding that average of how many pounds we can expect. Um, my business part partner, Adam, is the green buyer for the company, uh, meaning he's responsible for he, he's living, he likes to say he, he lives six months in the future because he has to project out, which is impossible, um, how much coffee we're going to need in six months. And is that coffee contracted? Is it on the water? Uh, meaning is it, you know, in, in transit to the country? Um, is it delayed? Um, what happens if we land a huge account? Do we have enough coffee uh, to supply them um, in six months? What happens if we lose a huge account? What are we going to do with all this extra coffee? Uh, so that's that's a challenge for sure. Um, but even when things I'm a generally optimistic person. And even when I let myself get more on the pessimistic side and say like, oh, no one's gonna order this week. We still have those orders come through. Um, we have very great wholesale partners who, um, who typically order pretty well and don't cause a ton of stress for us. Uh, and, you know, no matter what, we say the order cutoff is Monday at noon and we're still going to get orders Tuesday morning. And that just is the way it goes. But um, yeah, it, I, going back to your original question, it can be scary, but uh, coffee is luckily in demand always. And uh, depending on how the economy shapes up, um, people will order, they'll just order different things. Mm -hmm. That's part of the Adam's job is learning what he can buy and what's going to sell in, in six months. Yeah, that's the, um, that's a very hard challenge for me, like to purchase like far out. Um, the not I think like the last question I have is more like marketing or like I don't know. It's not as a marketing, but since you're talking about like one of the challenge for you is like growing a company. So what is your current plan for growing? Like, do you do like social media marketing? Are you targeting like individual buyers or more like wholesale? Um, we've, for the first time, branched into doing some marketing. Uh, like, sorry, we've branched into doing paid marketing where we've hired a, a firm to um, do social media um, advertising mm -hmm. as well as email marketing and stuff like that. Um, so we're just kind of getting into that. Um, I think it takes some time to see if that is a successful thing for a given company. I, don't, I can't say why it would work for one company selling cheap plastic trinkets from overseas um, versus maybe a specialty food company of some kind. Um, but I think there is... There is certainly a use for this kind of marketing. I just don't know 
to what degree it exists in our industry. And we're trying to figure out where, um, where to best apply our resources to make those sales. Um, we also have salespeople uh, who work for us and some of their specialties may be reaching out to small cafes. Some may be reaching out to huge conglomerates who are international uh, and some may be uh, focusing on grocery store sales, which are very different from all of the above. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, how long have you been doing that pay marketing? Because I noticed I, it started to pop up on my Facebook. Oh, you, you, you okay. Well, that's, <laughs> no, um, we started, uh, we started trying paid marketing, I think a month and a half ago. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, that's about a time that I started to see that on my Facebook. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a moving target. Um, currently, we're working on getting uh, maybe photos that work better for the ads, um, trying to figure out should the ads have text in them? Should, do people know this is coffee is a question. And like, how do we make it clear that this white bag with a rainbow label is a bag of coffee? Um, there's a lot of thought that goes into it that, like I said, um, it's always something new. It's never boring. It's just always something new that you yeah. have to tackle. Um, this is why I like also interview questions, but no, I personally do like branding work and the like, social media website. So like the first time I got coffee, I was like, huh, this branding is really, really colorful for coffee because you know most of the brands, existing brands are using the natural colors, you know, like brown mm -hmm. paper bag. Like how come you decide to say, hey, this unity, I want to like, like seven different colors. Well, uh, our company tagline is vibrant coffees from producers we love. And I think we want that echoed by the branding. Uh, we want to mm -hmm. be vibrant and loud because um, that's what we want our coffee to be. Um, we, I would say for a long time, but even now we've focused on, we, do, do you know the difference between like a natural process and a washed process coffee, or does that not mean? Mm -mm. Okay. Most of the coffee you've probably had in your life has been washed. Um, washed coffee is great. I drink washed coffee all the time. Um, but basically what it means, um, is well, I, I, I can get into it, but uh, <laughs> when you pick the cherry yeah. with the two coffee seeds inside it, you're mm -hmm. either going to let that fruit stay around those beans mm -hmm. and that will ferment in its own way, or you're going to strip away all that uh, flesh, that fruit, and um, that would be a wash coffee. You're, you're washing that fruit and pulp off of the beans. Um, so both in, in both instances, um, you can achieve vibrant coffees, as we say, but we've really focused on that natural process coffee, which is leaving the fruit on there, um, which leads to some compelling, unique flavors um, versus a lot of washed coffee is going to taste similar and it's going to be, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into either way. Um, <laughs> But we were very focused on those loud natural coffees for a long time. Um, and like I said, we still are, but um, there's no getting around that wash coffee is the most common thing um, within our industry. And so this is all to say that we wanted our brand to echo what we were hoping to serve inside of that bag. Minimalism and earth tones and all that are good. I, I understand it. Um, but I, I like the eye catching fun that we try and have with our brand. Yeah, I think it was great. I think it's really stand out, you know, like from other brands as well. I want to thank you so much for your time, you know, like to talk to me today. Um, really appreciate, you know, like share with me, like your story. I think it's really inspiring to hear well, what you are doing. Th yeah. Thanks for the questions um I, I feel like I was all over the place with my answers so I hope you can um pull what you need to from <laughs> from them 